So I was happened to be hunting this year down by a very remote little border. Aiden, you guys know that one? I was totally blown away by the number of trucks heading across that tiny little Aiden border crossing and thought that it would be actually a, a good opportunity to hear from somebody about transporting grain to the U.S. So I'm very pleased to, to have Mark with MNP give us a talk on that. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you today about uh, selling farm products into the United States. My name is Mark Ritchie, and I work in our specialty tax group at MNP. And I'm glad to be here today with Trevor Tamke, who is one of our partners in our specialty tax group at MNP. And we're going to be dividing the presentation in two. Uh, not that it's a long presentation, but it might give a little more variety and so on. So, um, <laughs> is there anything else you want to add to our intro? Okay. We'll get out. Yeah. So, uh, this has been uh, becoming a larger issue, I think, that farmers have been needing to navigate. And, and that is because of the flexibility allowed by the, the wheat board now as far as selling grain into the United States. <laughs> and on the other side of that, we've seen a number of developments within the IRS and the U.S. tax system that is really starting to clamp down on you know, people that they feel haven't been paying the taxes that they should be paying in the United States. And so we've seen that a lot with um, individuals, a lot of things the IRS has been doing in order to have individuals for U.S. citizens become compliant on returns. We've seen it with regard to cross-border <coughs> activities between corporations that may be related to one another and information filings and so on. And we see it as a risk to farmers who are selling products across the border. And something that we're trying to inform our clients about just so that they can be aware of the risks and the filing requirements and, and things like that. So we're happy to bring that message to you today. And if you have any questions during the presentation, f feel free to, to just interrupt and we'll try to address them as we go. Okay. All right, so when we look at selling farm products into the United States, a very important consideration is where title to those farm products transfers. So if we're dealing with a situation where title passes in Canada, the farm product is purchased in Canada from the farmer and it becomes the product of the purchaser who then carries it across the border, that's a different scenario than have when we have a farmer who takes their product to the United States, sells it in the United States, and title to the product transfers within the borders of the United States. Okay, so that is not always clear when you are in an arrangement where you have product to sell to a U.S. purchaser. It's not always clear where <coughs> title transfers. So we find that we have to take a close look at the purchase and sale agreements, the shipping documents, in order to determine where title actually transfers. And it, it, quite often it does transfer in the United States. A good rule of thumb to think about when you are maybe trying to determine whether your product is transferring title in Canada or in the United States relates to um, the insurance on the product in transport. So um, certainly if it's being transported in your truck you know, you know that you still have ownership of it until you get there. But when you're dealing with a common carrier, there's likely going to be a shipping agreement that will provide for insurance while in transit. If something was to happen to that product in transit, who would the insurance company pay? Now, if they are going to pay you as the farmer, it's likely that you still own that product and you bear the risk of any loss if the insurance proceeds are not enough to cover the value of the product you're shipping. Alternatively, if the insurance company pays the purchaser and they bear the risk of loss, then it's likely they actually own that product in transport. Okay. So something to keep in mind when we're determining where the product transfers title. Now, once we know that we're dealing with sales in the United States, 
then we're in the area where we may be considered having uh, business operations in the States or have income that's effectively connected with a U.S. trade or business. And the criteria for that are generally, you know, you're, you're selling product down there on kind of a regular and continuous basis. And that generally is a fairly low threshold and one that we don't need to worry too much about, um, partly because of the Canada-U.S. tax treaty. <coughs> so the Canada-U.S. tax treaty prevents the U.S. federal government from applying federal taxes to Canadian businesses unless they have what we call a permanent establishment in the United States. Okay. Now, permanent establishment is uh, a little bit of a technical term in the treaty, but it, it is partly what you would think it is. It, you know, it's an office, uh, a place of business in the United States. So certainly if you have an office, a phone number, an address in the United States, and you're, you're presenting yourself as doing business in the United States, you're gonna have a permanent establishment. Most farmers we find don't have that. But permanent establishment also involves um, some criteria that you might not consider. And in the case of farmers, one of those criteria relates to how they market and sell their product in the United States. So if a farmer is in the United States, uh, marketing their product and concluding on contracts with purchasers while in the United States, that can trigger a permanent establishment under the Canada-US tax treaty. So as a farmer, if you want to be able to use the permanent establishment exemption in the Canada-US tax treaty, you have to be very careful with regard to how you market and conclude on contracts within the United States, okay? Um, so maybe just to draw that distinction a little more. If you're in Canada and you conclude on a contract, so you have phone conversations with the purchaser, they send you documents up to sign, and you sign them in Canada and you send them back and you never have set foot in the United States and you're not down there concluding on contracts, then you wouldn't be considered having a permanent establishment. So that's different than being down there, concluding on contracts and marketing your own product, okay? So a little bit about what a permanent establishment is not. So a permanent establishment is not having inventory stored in the United States. So if you happen to have inventory stored down there, that can still be okay. You don't necessarily trip a permanent establishment just because you have a, a grain storage or, or something like that in the United States. Also, if you have somebody that you have contracted with, a firm, an individual in the United States to help you market your product, and they are independent of your company, so they're not an employee, but they maybe have their own business of, of marketing and selling products for a variety of different people, that doesn't trigger a permanent establishment either, okay? So that's different than if either you go down there or you send your employee down there, uh, that, that would trigger a permanent establishment if you're concluding contracts down there. So having an independent uh, marketer would not create a permanent establishment. Okay. All right, I think this is where I was going. Um, so basically, uh, so if, if uh, like we say, in most cases, uh, most people don't have a permanent es establishment in, in the U.S. And uh, you know, if, if they were getting into a position where, uh, you know, say we're getting concerned about concluding contracts, we can we can manage that in terms of how we how we uh, conduct our, our U.S. business and, and hopefully get ourselves into a position where everything is kind of being concluded in Canada. Uh, so that we can establish that we don't have a permanent establishment in, in the states. So at that point, uh, if we've determined that we don't have a permanent establishment, uh, basically what, what we want to do is uh, file what we call a treaty protective uh, tax return. And basically what this, what this return is, is, is you're filing a return to notify the IRS that 
you know what, I don't have a permanent establishment in the United States, so you're not allowed to, uh, to assess any uh, U.S. federal tax. Um, so it, it's important that if, if you are, you know, quote unquote, doing business in the U.S., if we have some sales going down there, um, in the event that we don't have a permanent establishment, we want to file this, uh, this return. If, if you don't file the return, they do have the ability to come back you know, later on and say, you know, oh, you know, we think we, you do have a permanent establishment and we're going to try to assess uh, tax on you. So this is really to, to protect, uh, protect yourself against any future possible challenges uh, from the IRS. Uh, the, it's quite actually severe if, if uh, in the event that they feel that you have a per permanent establishment and try to assess tax on you, uh, they do have the ability to uh, assess a tax on your gross gross revenues uh, from, from those uh, U.S. sales. So they basically would, it would not uh, allow you to claim any deductions and would just hit you with a, you know, a tax on the gross revenue. So it's very punitive in the event that they, they would come back later on and try to assess tax. So this is, following this, what we call a treaty, treaty return is really the safest way of uh, protecting yourself against any, uh, any future uh, issues with the IRS. Um, so that, that covers kind of the, the US federal uh, tax issues. Now, we also have, have to consider uh, US state tax uh, considerations. Uh, because the states, uh, all of the individual states are not party to the Canada-U.S. tax treaty. And so each state kind of sets their own rules uh, about what they're going to tax and what, what they're not going to tax. And so depending on what state you're, you're, you're selling to, um, you know, there, there's, there's uh, considerations that need to be made on what needs to be filed. Um, so most commonly, you know, we see a, a lot of uh, people selling into Montana. Uh, there is you know, Montana state income tax. So if, if you are uh, selling product down there, basically uh, a lot of states have a very low threshold as to what they consider to be doing business in their particular state. So, you know, the minute you're selling product into, into Montana, it's, you know, it's likely that there's going to be uh, some state I income tax considerations. And this is, this is usually not, not really the end of the world. Um, if, if you're selling down there, basically what, what the result is going to be is that there's going to be a Montana state uh, income tax return that, that may need to be filed. Um, there may be some taxes that would, that would need to be paid to the state of Montana. However, uh, in the event that you do owe some tax in Montana, basically you'll get a, a credit here in, in Canada on your Canadian income tax return for the taxes that you've paid down there. So it doesn't result and any, any additional taxes that, that you're going to have to pay, it just, it, you're just writing a check uh, for tax to the, uh, you know, to the Montana government and, and you get a credit for, for it here in Canada. So it's, it's not the end of the world, it's just kind of a, an additional filing uh, that needs to be done. Uh, typically, and I know Mark can comment on this more, but uh, uh, the Montana income tax rate is, is actually even lower than uh, than kind of what you would normally see is the like the Alberta uh, tax rate uh, here in Canada. So, uh, like I say, it's it's not like you're gonna you're gonna end up paying any more tax than you would otherwise have paid had you just sold the uh, the, the uh, product here in Canada. Um, we also have to consider uh, sales tax, and so again, uh, you know, much like here in Canada, we have different provinces have different uh, sales taxes to consider. And so the same thing in the U United States. So each state uh, may, may have its own rules on, on uh, sales taxes. And so one, one, you know, one good thing uh, about, about Montana, I guess, is, is uh, there is no sales tax from what I understand. So not a consideration uh, that you, or not an issue if, if you're selling into Montana, but depending on which state uh, you're selling into, it's just something that needs to be considered. Uh, a lot of states would have exemptions, uh, exemptions from sales tax for, for, for producers, uh, much like, you know, here, here in Canada we have, uh, you know, uh, from, the, from the GST, we, we don't have to worry about uh, charging GST on agricultural products. So 
different things like that to consider. But uh, again, depending on what state state you're in, you have to look at the rules for that individual state to make sure that you're you're complying with those. Um, so just to, to kind of run down uh, the kind of the analysis that you need to go through. Uh, so first of all, the first question is, uh, do you have do you have U.S. sales? And so. Uh, basically, going back to what we, we talked about before, so is is the uh, is the sale of the product being made in the U.S. And so, if title is transferring uh, in the U.S., that's considered to be a U.S. sale. So, if, if we if we don't have that, if if every if title is transferring here in Canada, we don't have any U.S. sales, and as a result, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, worry about filing anything. If title is transferring. In the U.S., we have a U.S. sale, and then we, we kind of move on to see what filings are going to be required. Okay, so the next question we have to ask is, is there a permanent establishment? If you happen to have a permanent establishment, uh, basically you're going to need to file a full-blown uh, U.S. federal income tax return, and there's going to be some U.S. tax that would, would need to be paid uh, to the federal government. Uh, like we say, in, in most cases, people are not going to have a permanent establishment down there and so basically we're, we're then into the posi position where we would just file what we we talked about before the treaty treaty based return that's just uh, you don't owe any any US federal tax you're just taking the position under the Canada US tax treaty that we don't have a permanent establishment so we don't owe any US federal tax uh, the next question it, it, do we have what's called a nexus in any state and again uh, like I mentioned, that usually the bar is pretty low on, on what constitutes kind of doing business in, in a particular state. And so in most cases, the, you know, the, the answer is going to be, be yes. And so as a result, you need to, f to consider what uh, a filing uh, a, a state tax return in that particular state. Um, again, with the, with the sales tax, you have to look at whether there's a, an actual sales tax that might apply in that particular state and whether there's a return that needs to be filed. So that kind of covers um, all the potential kind of filings that may need to be done. Again, it's, it's uh, you know, if you made the decision that, it, you know, from a business perspective, it, it, it makes sense to, to ship uh, your products down, down to the States for whatever reason, you're, you know, you're getting a better price, the exchange rates uh, in your favor, that kind of thing. Uh, it's not it's not the end of the world that we have these tax issues that come up we just need to understand what the uh, what the filings or what filings are required and make sure that you're not you know kind of running afoul of of uh, the filing requirements in the US because again uh, typically uh, you know if if you're required to file something in the in the US and you don't uh, don't file it typically they, they they penalize pretty harshly down there uh, down there uh, and uh, the IRS, as we found, has been getting fairly aggressive with uh, with uh, going after people, and especially uh, especially kind of foreigners who are doing doing business in the U.S. Uh, and you know, the, the kind of what we found uh, in the in the last few years is uh, with the uh, kind of the economic uh, landscape down there that. You know, the U.S. federal government is is looking for money. A lot of states are are in rough financial shape, so they're all they're all looking to, to collect some additional tax revenue. So, uh, they've been taking a lot of steps to to kind of crack down on on uh, potential tax uh, taxpayers down there. Uh, so that's that's basically our, our, our presentation. Uh, we'd invite any any questions you might have. Well, Mark and I are going to be around. Uh, can stick around afterwards for a little while if anyone anyone has any questions. Um, so, you know, a lot of people a lot of people look at uh, you know this the, these U.S. tax issues as as uh, scary stuff. Or you know, a lot of people a lot of people like to kind of bury their heads in the sand and say it's you know it's not my problem. How are they going to catch me? Stuff like that. Um, again, it's it's a it's a risk that's there. Um, what we don't want to see ever is you know somebody getting you know, hammered with huge penalties by the IRS. And so uh, in a lot of these cases, uh, the, the filings that need to be done are fairly straightforward. Uh, it doesn't result in you owing, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of additional tax or anything like that. So, you know, our, our advice to, to people who are in that situation is to become aware of what your filing obligations are and make sure that you're, you're staying on side with, uh, with the filings with the, the U.S. 
government, uh, save yourself a lot of uh, heartache down the road. So, um, any questions at all from from anyone? Yeah. What if you want like a winter residence in Phoenix, but you're just calling stuff? Is there, does that give you that uh, residence status? Uh, and the answer to that is likely not. Um, so. If, if this is just a personal vacation property and you're not using it for any sort of business activity, uh, you're not, you know, you, you haven't advertised that this is your, that this is your U.S. address for your, your, your business, it's, it's not going to be considered to be associated with your, your business, so that, that wouldn't uh, create a permanent establishment in the, in the States. Yeah? Uh, Trevor, does, I know the U.S., the Yankees have this intention to file Three years or something like that, or four years, was that applied to Canadians? Or? Mark, do you know what? Like, no, I'm not, not sure. File their income tax. I mean, they oh, have, have do, to do you mean extensions? Uh, well, I've heard of people carrying it for up to three or four years back, as long as they fill out a form that says they intend to file. It kind of simplifies it. They, yeah, they hold it back. Okay, so. Um, I'm not exactly sure what, what you're referring to. I know that there has been some new voluntary disclosure programs in place for uh, individuals who are uh, citizens of the United States residing in Canada, and there's a streamlined program which requires three years of tax returns uh, going back, and so you, you file that as a package with um, some foreign bank account reporting forms. And um, so perhaps if if you're in a situation where you're looking at, okay, I'm going to file for the current year, and I'm going to let them know about my intention to file under the voluntary disclosure program for the prior three years, uh, that might be something that, that you're thinking of. Um, in addition to that, in the U.S., the tax system is a little bit different in that they have multiple extensions and multiple different due dates. And so um, if you're looking at filing down there, it's quite often that the return, your original due date will be extended you know, a number of months in order to allow you to get the information you need to actually complete that filing. So it's, the due dates are something else you'll, you need to be aware of. Well, draw me in thanking these guys.